The Subcommittee on Livestock and Foreign Agriculture will now come to order. I want to thank uh, my colleagues, members of the Subcommittee, uh, for their participation this morning. Uh, the topic that we are going to be discuss is uh, um, trade policy and priorities, which uh, for American agriculture is always a critical issue that uh, we are engaged in. And uh, as we look at um, the uh, challenges that we face uh, with American agricultural trade over the last uh, a decade, I would say, and then uh, prior to the pandemic, and then the effects of, of uh, our supply chain being turned upside down uh, with the closure of restaurants and schools. Last spring, we've seen how fragile um, uh, that very complicated, complex food supply chain uh, can uh, turn on its head, and of course the impact to prices in terms of not only our producers and processors throughout the country, uh, but our consumers who fill them when uh, they're uh, at the grocery store. And uh, of course we see that uh, being impacted today, and I'm sure that will be part of the conversation that we have. I want to thank members of the committee, uh, subcommittee for your participation, and I want to thank the witnesses as well. Uh, we have four, uh, I think, witnesses that will provide a good regional perspective of how they view the trade policy and priorities and make good suggestions to all of us. Um, and um, after my uh, opening remarks, uh, we will receive testimony from our witnesses, and then following our normal procedure, we'll recognize members uh, based upon alternating uh, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, Republican, um, after uh, the testimony has been presented to us. Uh, members will be recognized in the order of their arrival, that staff will inform me on what their order of arrival was, and I'll rely on that to be the, uh, the judgment. Uh, and of course, everybody's familiar with the five minutes you have to ask questions or make statements. Sometimes members like to do both. Um, but obviously, given the um, hybrid no, uh, manner in which this hearing is being held, uh, those who are uh, participating uh, from your, your, your desktop or, or wherever you might be, please mute yourself. Uh, we all sometimes forget that uh, we're multitasking and, uh, and uh, you may be being, doing something else and you're, and you're, you're live and that obviously is not helpful to the subcommittee hearing purpose. Um, in consultation with the uh, ranking member, my friend um, uh, from South Dakota, pursuant to Rule 11E, uh, e, uh, I want to make the members of the subcommittee aware that uh, we may have members of the full committee that may join us today, and oftentimes the chair and the ranking member uh, does uh, do that, and when they do, we certainly give them the opportunity to, um, to, uh, to comment. Uh, so, um, without objection, the chair may recess the committee subject to the call of order of the chair at any point during this meeting. It's an informational hearing. I don't think we're going to get in any big disputes that that would be required. Uh, so, um, uh, let, me, uh, let me start with my opening statement. I'd like to thank uh, our witnesses in advance. Uh, we know that uh, trade is a critical part of, um, of American agriculture. We held a hearing on this last month. Uh, we um, um, were listening to some of the impacts that the uh, problems with our supply chain uh, are having in terms of not only um, getting products into uh, to our country, but also the fact, as an example, the Port of Los Angeles and, and Long Beach that hold, uh, that handle 40% of the container uh, imports that we find that uh, unfortunately some of those uh, containers or uh, ships are departing uh, empty. And uh, I think that's a, a challenge that we have to address. The president uh, obviously has attempted to focus on making changes to that effect. There's pieces of legislation that are uh, uh, attempting to try to uh, relieve this bottleneck that we're having within our supply chain. But um, uh, when, you, when you look at um, Again, my home state as an example, 44% of the agriculture that we produce in California is exported. Uh, that's a big number, it's almost half. And um, 
and, and a lot of these products have, uh, you know, shelf life in terms of their perishable nature, and the notion that they can simply wait uh, is not uh, acceptable. Um, this hearing today, I think, presents an opportunity for us to hear from a diverse group of agricultural stakeholders about their trade priorities and barriers that they face. And it's important for we as members of uh, Congress and this subcommittee that focuses not just on livestock but foreign trade that we uh, are um, listening uh, to do whatever we possibly can to deal with these current challenges. Um, and I think um, uh, when we talk about the efforts that the uh, Biden administration is following, how well uh, we can um, uh, complement those efforts. Uh, I want to acknowledge that our witnesses' testimony on supply chain concerns were raised multiple times last month. This issue has been focused on. We're still, uh, I don't think, completely have uh, um, a handle on all the things that I think we need to be doing uh, to deal with this critical uh, supply chain problem. But I think we need to continue to be focused uh, and remind people of the importance of remedying this problem. Um, and these slowdowns just don't impact uh, consumers, but they hurt our farmers, uh, our um, dairymen and women, uh, our agricultural workers. Um, it has a ripple effect that um, obviously we are feeling today. Constructing a productive agricultural trade agenda is important, whether it was the last administration or this administration. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, with the incredible production that American agriculture uh, is capable of producing, uh, we need to make sure that we work hand in glove with American agriculture. Um, and, and different challenges we know uh, are being faced by uh, farmers in different regions of our country. Uh, so that's why I'm looking forward to hearing from the witnesses today on how we can better improve our trade policy. Over the past few years, we have engaged in a number of agreements, talks with nations around the world, including uh, Japan, China, Canada, and Mexico. Um, exciting news that uh, we've reached an agreement with Japan uh, that I think uh, the administration is announcing today on how we can coordinate that effort. I was a, a supporter of the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, uh, some four or five years ago that was worked on by multiple administrations. Um, and fortunately, uh, we, we dropped out of that, in, in my view. Uh, but I did support uh, the, the previous administration's efforts with the U.S.-Canada-Mexico trade agreement. Obviously, uh, now we need to make sure that the uh, commitments in that trade agreement are complied with whether we're talking about phytosanitary standards or a host of other efforts between our neighbors to the north and to the south, Canada and Mexico. Um, now uh, we find ourselves in a situation uh, where China's continuously changing regulations that govern the rules of engagement uh, for U.S. food and agricultural business is, I think, uh, once again uh, staring us in the eye. Uh, the expanded registration requirements for U.S. facilities under Decree 248 is just one example. Uh, and uh, I think these relationships need to be worked on. I'm pleased this week that the Biden administration uh, had a high level discussion. Um, and the fact is, is that uh, we've got to stay on top of this. Uh, agriculture and trade must be considered uh, as we look at the global adoption of sustainable alternatives, not only to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as it relates to climate change, uh, but many of the people of the panel that are testifying will tell you incredible things that they're doing to, uh, in fact, uh, reduce their own carbon footprint. I look forward to hearing how these initiatives may be advanced through trade. The panel before us has in-depth knowledge. I've read their testimony. Look forward to hearing it and, and asking questions. So I think this is a good point of productive discussion on how we can expand global trade. And I'd like to recognize my friend, the ranking member uh, from South Dakota, Mr. Johnson, for any remarks he would like to make at this time. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you also for this hearing and uh, for the topic. Uh, it is hard to overstate the importance of market access to American agricultural producers, so thank you to you and, and the committee staff. Of course, I'll thank you also to the witnesses before us. Uh, American farmers and ranchers, they produce the highest quality crops, livestock, poultry, and dairy in the world. And not for nothing, uh, they produce them efficiently. Uh, that value proposition is well known across the globe, and that's why 20% uh, of American agriculture uh, production is, is exported. And since we've got uh, one of the nation's foremost leaders in soybeans with us today, I should note that that's uh, doubly true for soybeans. Half of America's soybeans and 60% and of South Dakota's soybeans uh, are sold overseas. And that international demand, of course, that exerts upward pressure on price. That means billions, billions of dollars for American producers. Uh, trade accounts for an average of $56 uh, of value for each hog marketed in this country. You just think about uh, how much real money that is and how that uh, ripples throughout rural economies from the farm gate to Main Street. Uh, just an, an enormous impact. Yeah, so the price American farmers and ranchers receive for their production depends uh, in no small part on the strength of America as an exporter and frankly as a negotiator. Can we secure uh, fair deals uh, with other countries? And at the end of the last administration, we made some positive progress on a phase one agreement that included numerous sanitary and phytosanitary and biotech uh, provisions that increase the accessibility and the predictability in the Chinese market. Uh, again, critically important. And, and we don't want to let that progress uh, get lost between administrations. And so we want to continue to be proactive and ambitious. An important step here would be for this administration to prioritize trade and our trading relationships and work to give agriculture uh, a better seat at the table. Uh, this administration's approach to trade, it, it has got to become more ambitious because every day that our country doesn't lead, uh, others will fill the gap. Uh, it took, I think we all realize, nine months uh, for uh, a chief agricultural negotiator to get appointed, and we're still awaiting a nominee for Undersecretary of Foreign and Agricultural Affairs. And I think it's important that the priorities uh, of all of our witnesses, and, and frankly, American agri agricultural producers across the country, are represented as we are talking about expanded uh, market access, increased exports, and, and a more level playing field. And then I think the chairman did a good job mentioning the supply chain, so I'll touch on that. We, we, this administration must continue to seek pragmatic solutions to the supply chain crisis, which is putting a serious strain on our American agricultural producers, uh, and frankly, the entire U.S. economy. Uh, the full committee heard from a slate of witnesses a few weeks ago about the combination of challenges contributing to the crisis uh, and the breaking uh, of consumer confidence that is include, uh, you know, the, the repercussions of that uh, and the cause of that can be increased inflation, skyrocketing energy costs, a shortage of available goods and labor. And while our supply chain falters, our trading relationships falter. Uh, I'm glad to hear many of our witnesses will be speaking to the importance of passing the Open Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2021, which I'm leading with Representative Garamendi. And I'm grateful for the support of so many on this committee for that legislation. And uh, it, it is that support, that growing support, more than 200 national organizations. Uh, last time I checked, uh, more than 70 members of the House that are going to keep that momentum building. So uh, by way of closing, Mr. Chairman, I would just uh, note I'm looking forward to the remarks of our witnesses and to learning about their priorities as well as their thoughts for how we can move forward. Thank you, sir. I thank the gentleman for his opening comments, and I just want to note that uh, uh, Congressman Garamendi and I began working on that effort with the uh, legislation uh, to make changes in uh, uh, Ocean and uh, Maritime Commission and how they operate and on the issues of demerge and also some of the other problems that we're having um, on our ports and harbors. And I want to thank the uh, ranking member for his efforts along with mine with the Problem Solvers Caucus to get their endorsement on that important legislation. It's part of an overall effort that I think we have to be in, engaged in. Um, the chair will now uh, recognize if the gentleman from Pennsylvania would like to make any opening comments. Uh, 
If not, we'll proceed on to our witnesses. No, absolutely. I'd like to make some opening comments. Thank you, Chairman, Ranking Member, uh, this uh, important hearing. Uh, critically important. I echo the sentiment of Ranking Member Johnson and, and echo his calls for this administration to prioritize trade. We know that in the Great, great Recession, 2009, um, it was trade that uh, resulted in agriculture being the only industry to not really uh, fail and falter the way that others did. And um, it is so incredibly important. I also ask my colleagues to commit to hosting Ambassador Tai sooner than later. And once can um, approve our, uh, uh, our a chief agriculture uh, negotiator. We we need those voices at the table. It's uh, long overdue, and we need to have them before the the full <coughs> the full agriculture committee, so we can have a good conversation and, um, and to be able to work with them in a in a committed way. Uh, for trade. Uh, we need our trading partners to stand by their existing commitments, um, and, we, um, and we have issues with that. Uh, recent travels in uh, um, uh, Georgia, Florida, you know, there's uh, some abuses, uh, I think, that Mexico is doing uh, in and around uh, circumventing the uh, USMCA, uh, really hurting our fruits and vegetables. Um, and it's uh, and our trading partners need to be held accountable. Uh, on the northern tier, uh, where I hail from, it's uh, you know Canada circumventing uh, a, a great change to their isolationist dairy policy, which they did eliminate what we asked them to eliminate, but then they created like a 4A uh, to right. circumvent it, and that's not acceptable. And it's really disturbing that we we don't have as of yet an official chief agriculture and trade negotiator. Uh, because they need to be at the table to help for, with the oversight of that. Um, and so administration needs to step up and work overtime to mitigate the many problems impacting our supply chains, much of which impacts our exports and the viability of our producers. I've, I've been a little uh, actually disturbed with all the conversation coming out of the White House, and they're focused on this, what looks like the uh, the Japanese armada parked off the, the coast of your great state, Chairman, um, with, the, with the focus being how fast can we go and load those foreignly manufactured goods, get them on trucks, and so the Americans can buy them. And then we're sending what seems to be happening is, and maybe we'll hear a little more about this today, we, we have these shipping containers going back empty while we have agriculture commodities sitting at the ports paying fees to be staged there. Um, and so we need the administration to, to wake up and to recognize it's shipping both ways. It's not just not getting them unloaded and distributed, those foreign manufactured goods, but we, we need to be able to have, be shipping our commodities and our agriculture commodities, those things that those great Americans, those American farmers and ranchers and foresters uh, produce each and every day. Uh, I may have to step out here. I actually have a meeting with the chairman um, of the full committee, and I, I apologize for that. But I look forward to further reviewing witness testimony and gathering information from your responses to member uh, questions. And with that, I yield back. Well, I thank the chairman for his comments. And uh, let me just assure you that in my conversations with the Secretary of Agriculture, uh, they are uh, very acutely aware of the situation with the uh, container problem, and uh, we brought this to their attention earlier this year. It's one of the reasons this legislation that uh, we are supporting with Congressman Garamendi is important, so that we can have uh, various uh, options uh, to prevent these ships from uh, returning empty. Uh, everyone recognizes that is a problem, and uh, we intend to do something about that. As far as uh, getting uh, Ambassador Tai before the full committee or the subcommittee, we're working on both and I, for all the right reasons that you articulated. And finally, it, it, there's a bit of a two-way street, I believe, and that is that uh, while the administration has moved with nominations, uh, the Senate has a, a clock of their own, it seems, uh, as it comes to uh, confirming these appointments. And so that's part of uh, the, the challenge that we face. And uh, so um, with that said, let us begin with our first witness. Um, Mr. Kent uh, Stendrup uh, is a third generation farmer in Arvin, California, uh, in the Southern San Joaquin Valley. Uh, prior to the, the last reapportionment, I used to represent he and the incredible producers down in that portion of Kern County. Uh, their uh, family operation is well known, third generation farmer. 
It consists of um, a diversified uh, agricultural portfolio that includes trees, vines, and row crops. He and his family have for years participated in many different ways. He is a director in Blue Diamond Growers, and he's testifying on their behalf. So with not, without further ado, I'd like to recognize our first witness for five minutes, um, uh, Mr. Kent uh, Stenderup. Kent? Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for holding this timely hearing on this very important subject. <clears throat> My family has been honored to have Chairman Costa as our assemblyman and also as our congressman for a few terms. It's good to see you in those golden fields of Arvin. <laughs> yeah, that's being hopeful. You know, that could happen. It happens once every five years. We get snow down to about right. 15 feet. So, <clears throat> also welcoming uh, member Josh Harder, who's a very important ag leader in our valley also. So, uh, as I as has been mentioned, I'm, I can't stand up, but I'm a managing partner for the family farm. We've got 800 acres of almonds, 900 acres of row crops. We also grow some Thompson seedless grapes that are used for white grape juice concentrate. And that concentrates a non-added sugar for non-corn fructose natural sweetener. Uh, it, it's used for jams, jellies, and fruit juices. If we're in the, in the Leno Growers Co-op, I happen to be on that co-op board also. We're in the process of filing a countervailing and dumping charge against Argentina with the Department of Commerce and the USTR. So as you can hear, my family believes in the co-op business model. And I, but here to, I'm here today to testify on behalf of Blue Diamond Growers as a director and grower member. Blue Diamond Growers is a nonprofit grower-owned cooperative organized in the year 19,010. Over half of the 6,000 almond growers in California belong to Blue Diamond Growers. I'm immediate past chair of the Almond Board in California, which is the federal marketing order overseen by USDA that benefits our industry. It is very much appreciated that you're holding this important trade hearing and priorities on policy and priorities. Trade is the lifeblood of US ag. Blue Diamond is the world's latest almond marketer and processor. We employ over 1,900 employees with our headquarters in, in Sacramento. Blue Diamond ships almonds to all 50 states and also including India, Spain, China, Japan, just to name a few destinations. And yes, we too support Elaine um, Trevino as the Ag Trade Ambassador at USTR, the president's nominated her, and now we hope the Senate will confirm her. She has agricultural support, get those, get those, open, those markets open worldwide. And also the, the empty position at the um, Under Secretary of Trade and Foreign Ag. So the, uh, it's important that the committee support the Foreign Ag Service as much as possible. This committee is encouraged to do all possible and necessary to support FAS, its employees and its necessary budget. It is hoped and recommended that the committee recognize the importance and benefit that U.S. agriculture receives from the Market Access Program, also known as MAP. The program is an ex outstanding example of the real partnership between government and ag port exports. If you're not familiar, this is an important cost-sharing program. The program helps our members promote and advertise in countries where it would not otherwise be possible. Since Blue Diamond sells and exports its member of almonds under the Blue Diamond brand, it's, it is penalized with stricter rules and increased matching requirements. And this is the uh, trade association having those benefits over something known as a co-op model. May it be respectfully suggested that this committee investigate this and correct this difference. Cooperative farmers should not be treated differently than farmers whose products are promoted by the trade associations. This discrimination should end and will with your help. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to present this testimony and for your attention. I'll be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kent, for um, that, uh, I think, appropriate testimony. And I think it will certainly uh, reflect in questions that are asked by members of the committee uh, following um, uh, uh, the testimony of, uh, of all four witnesses, and please give uh, uh, some of our friends there my regards and tell them I, I said hi. Um, well done. Well done. 
Uh, our next witness is a constituent of mine, uh, and his family, like many uh, families throughout the country, have been farming for generations. Uh, Simon Vander Woody um, uh, is a co-owner of uh, Vander Woody uh, Dairy in Merced, California. Uh, he and his wife, uh, Christine, uh, and their family have been uh, a reflection of uh, uh, hardworking dairy families that we see throughout the country. He will be testifying uh, this morning uh, on behalf of the National Milk Producers Federation. He currently serves as um, California Dairies, Inc. co-op chairman. Uh, Mr. Vanderwoody, would you please open on your testimony? Yes, thank you for this opportunity, uh, Chairman Costa. Uh, good morning and thank you, uh, Chairman Costa and Ranking Member Johnson. I'm honored to appear before you today. And uh, my name is Simon Vanderwood, and I'm here to discuss trade policy and the critical role trade plays in supporting U.S. dairy farmers. My family has been in the dairy business since uh, not long after my grandparents immigrated here in 1949, uh, in the mid 50s. They uh, started a dairy in Del Mar, California, right along the beach. Um, in 1971, my parents started a dairy in Ramona, California. And in 1994, uh, my wife, Christine, and I started our own dairy in San Marcos, California, all down in San Diego County. Uh, in 2005, uh, Chris and I joined with my parents and built Vanderwater Dairy in Merced, California, up in the Central Valley. And uh, today that dairy milks 3,200 cows. Um, we also have two other dairies uh, that we've bought as a family, and uh, we are looking forward to welcoming our oldest son into the business uh, in January, and uh, we'll see what the Lord has in store for uh, the next five kids and as uh, time goes. Um, at our Vanderwater Dairy, we have incorporated a lot of environmental um, attributes. Uh, we have a 1.1 megawatt solar array. Uh, we recently uh, started our methane digester, and Congressman Costa, you are invited to the, the ribbon cutting on December 6th. I think you got that invite. Um, we do a lot of sustainable water. And I, I want to be there if I'm met. not in Washington. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> uh, a lot of uh, water farming and dairy management practices uh, that uh, are um, in incorporated in order to reduce our carbon footprint and uh, to create a more sustainable uh, model for, for our farms. Uh, as you said, I serve the chairman of the board of uh, California Dairies. Uh, we are the second largest co-op in the U dairy co-op in the U.S., uh, only based in California, though. And uh, we are the largest uh, skim milk powder producer in the world. And so most of that uh, skim milk, all of that skim milk powder uh, is exported. And being in California, that's one of our competitive advantages. Uh, on today, I'm testifying on behalf of the National Milk Producers Federation, uh, whose board I serve on, and I also uh, am the first vice chair of that uh, organization. America's dairy industry is an economic force employing almost a million Americans. Those are not just farm jobs. They are manufacturing and distribution jobs at our input suppliers, our processing plants, and our ports. Trade opportunities are an integral part of that story. Despite last year's difficulties, U.S. dairy upheld its reputation as suppliers of a variety of high quality, sustainably produced dairy products to the world. <clears throat> According to the U.S. Dairy Export Council, of which I also am a director, around one in every six gallons of milk produced here was exported to foreign markets to meet global demand. So that fits very closely to your 20% uh, number you talked about early on. <clears throat> Despite all the growth and success we have enjoyed, on the export front over the years, uh, we could be doing even better with a level playing field. Unfortunately, we don't have sufficient market access opportunities to, prov to provide us with tariff parity or better in key markets when compared to our trade competitors. As a result, American dairy farmers are left feeling the effects. In multiple markets, U.S. dairy exports have to sell at a discount to combat tariff differentials. While trade is all too often disparaged in this country and its benefits sold short, our competitors are busy forging agreements. Next spring, it'll have been a decade since our last free trade agreement with a new trading partner was implemented. We farmers need a proactive trade policy to keep pace and continue to increase sales to support the good farm and manufacturing jobs that dairy creates. Today, I would like to highlight three topics from my written testimony. First, the urgent need to address the immense challenges in export shipping. 
Second, the importance of negotiating new trade agreements to avoid a loss of export opportunities. And finally, the importance of enforcement of trade rules to combat mounting barriers. As some of you may have seen on the front page of the New York Times this week, uh, our CEO, Brad Anderson, was quoted uh, talking about the supply chain issues that we are facing with our dairy products here in California. Uh, dairy exporters are now facing soaring freight rates and unpredictable access to shipping containers, many of which are being rushed back to Asia empty to restock imported items. This volatility is wreaking havoc on our dairy exports and supply chains. To address this crisis, it is critical that Congress pass the Ocean Shipping Reform Act that uh, we understand uh, uh, Congressman Johnson uh, is a co-sponsor of, and we thank you for that. And we ask that the administration take further steps to deliver near-term relief to address these supply chain challenges. Reliability is a vital tenet of our export success, but is increasingly in question. Second, I can't stress enough that we need new trade agreements. Farmers need to see action and time is of the essence. We need trade deals with key markets like the United Kingdom and various Asian countries, including Japan. We need a level playing field in places like China. Moreover, as the US negotiates, it's critical that these markets be open for all dairy products. Most countries tend to tightly limit milk powder and butter imports, yet those are the products that our cooperative produces. These agreements must include access for all dairy products. Finally, we need to aggressively enforce our market access rights because we can't move forward without holding on to the access we won in prior WTO and FTA deals. The dairy industry strongly supports Ambassador's Thai decision to bring a USMCA dispute case against Canada for not administer administering its tariff rate quotas fairly. And we greatly appreciate Congress's support for this step. Enforcement should continue to be a key priority around the world to ensure that the United States receives the full benefits of its trade agreements. Again, Chairman Costa and Ranking Member Johnson, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify to this committee on the importance of global trade for all American dairy farm families, including my own. Thank well, you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vanderwood, and uh, points well taken, and let the record uh, stipulate that the fact that you're a constituent of the chairman has nothing to do with the generous time clock I gave you. <laughs> Thank you. Our next uh, witness uh, that we have uh, before us is um, um, the um, person, uh, Leticia. Here we go, our third witness. Get on the right page, Leticia. We're very pleased that you would uh, have the opportunity to testify with us, Red House. Leticia Red House is the director of the American Indian Foods Program, which is a part of the Intertribal Agricultural Council. Uh, Native Americans uh, historically have played an important role. Um, obviously, uh, uh, historically, we uh, often, too often, in my opinion, uh, forget that uh, critical uh, role, and we're very pleased that the Intertribal Agricultural Council is testifying before the subcommittee today. Ms. Ridhouse is an enrolled member of uh, Daye Nation and was raised in southeastern Utah. Uh, please uh, present your testimony, uh, uh, Ms. Ridhouse. Thank you so much, um, Chairman Costa, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee livestock on foreign agriculture. Thank you for invi inviting me to provide you all with some information regarding livestock and foreign agriculture trade. My name is Latasha Redhouse. I serve as the director of the American Indian Foods Program at the Intertribal Agriculture Council. I am a member of the Dinant Nation and I'm tuning in from the United Arab Emirates where I am representing tribal producers at Dubai's Expo World 2020 and Teratini um, indigenous uh, festivals of uh, Festival of Indigenous um, and Tribal Ideas. Well, that's Today. impressive. What time zone are you on? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm awake, I think. <laughs> what time is it in Doha? It's 7.37 p.m. Okay, very good. Yeah. Well, we're happy to have your testimony. Please proceed. Okay, thank you. Today, my testimony will focus on the possibilities for and barriers to livestock and foreign agriculture trade across Indian country. 
The Intertribal Agriculture Council was founded in 1987 to pursue and promote the conservation, development, and use of our agricultural resources for the betterment of our people. Land-based agricultural resources are vital to the economic and social welfare of many Native American and Alaskan tribes. The harmonies of man, soil, water, air, vegetation, and wildlife that collectively make up the American Indian agriculture community influence our emotional and spiritual well-being. Prior to 1987, American Indian agriculture was practically unheard of outside reservation boundaries. IAC's responsiveness to on-the-ground needs and extensive networks contribute across the spectrum of tribal food systems development and further governmental and partner outreach efforts through Indian country. Federal, state, and organizational partners draw upon IAC's ex expertise to inform programming and policies that directly impact in Indian country and beyond. Tribal agriculture production and food systems are essential economic development and community drivers in Indian country. According to the 2017 Census of Agriculture, nearly 80,000 tribal producers are operating on over 59 million acres of land while generating over 3.5 billion in economic activity. Some estimates uh, suggest that adequate investments in Indian country, including increased federal funding for foreign trade, and the removal of structural barriers to global market access could allow for the agriculture sector across Indian country to grow to a valuation of 45.4 billion, spurring economic growth that will contribute to the physical infrastructure necessary while providing the pathway to tribal self-determination, food sovereignty, and economic growth. I would like to mention that Chairman Costa, Member Correa, Member Harder, Member Kana, Member Hartzler, Member Moore, and Ranking Member Johnson, each represent states which are among the top 10 for American Indian and Alaska Native producers according to, to the 2017 Census of Agriculture. The American Indian Foods Program um, is, is a program offered by IAC with a contract with um, the USDA Foreign Agricultural Service. The partnership was developed as a platform for made produced by American Indian certified food and ag businesses to showcase products and share tribal cultures with the world. The program is designed to work with American Indian owned businesses to provide export education and to facilitate global market penetration while developing sustainable economics based on food production. The program is designed to offer domestic support to American Indian owned businesses interested in entering the international marketplace while developing sustainable economics based on food production. The program also promotes and authorizes the use of the made produced by American Indian certified trademark to assist American Indian producers in improving their market success, thereby increasing the economic base of the Indian producer and their community while protecting American Indian producers and consumers from fake and falsely advertised Indian made products. By converting the 3.3 billion in raw products, uh, food products currently already sold by producers on Indian reservations, today we, we predict that Indian country could alone um, become an economic powerhouse with an estimated 9 billion in premium food products. While the IAC AIF provides support to agricultural businesses seeking growth in the international marketplace, many IAC AIF members continue to experience increased uncertainty and risks at the pandemic limits activities as the pandemic limits activities and future trade developments. Persistent labor and supply chain issues coupled with the market uncertainties that both predate and accompany the, these pandemic imp impacts are driving this increased uncertainty along with the additional uncertainty and trauma of operating in a global pandemic that has disproportionately impacted native people. During this difficult time, Native producers' priorities understandably shifted away from seeking international markets to supporting their tribal communities. 93% of tribal producers responding to IAC's COVID-19 response survey indicated that the pandemic had impacted their international selves. As tribal communities began to emerge from pandemic-related uncertainties and look again to international markets, some long-standing policy and administrative problems must be remedied if tribal producers are going to be able to access inter international markets. One of the long-standing problems is the reality of infrastructure needs in Indian country agriculture, which for many years have gone underfunded or unfunded. Because of decades of being underserved by federal programs, Native producers began their pathway to accessing international markets with fewer resources than their non-Native counterparts. As a result, lag behind in market access despite producing specialty and niche products that would, be, um, that would do very well internationally. 
The reality of federal underservice to native producers and the need for native producers to have better pathways to access international markets was one of the driving factors behind the congressional adoption of Se Section 3312 of the Agricultural Improvement Act of 2018 or 2018 Farm Bill. The provision, one of the 63 tribal specific provisions included on the final legislation, required the Secretary of Agriculture to seek greater inclusion and participation of native farmers, ranchers, and producers on international trade missions and to report back to Congress about the status of native producers in trade missions. These missions represent critical opportunities to promote native products, pr produce products, many of which are highly desirable on the international market. Well, despite this. Uh, if yes. you'd please c close here. We're, um, the yeah, chairman's been very generous with the time this morning. I'm not sure why, but please conclude. Yep. Yep. So that that is um, our barriers. And if there are any questions or anything that I could share, feel free to reach out. Thank well, you. we appreciate that. And you're uh, a very good witness. And obviously, you're, you're well representing the uh, American Indian Foods Program as its director. And we Really appreciate the Intertribal Council's participation in this morning's hearing, and I'm sure there will be questions. So, thank you. Uh, our fourth witness today uh, is Ms. Jen uh, Sorensen. Ms. Sorensen is president of the National Pork Producers Council. For the past decade, she has been with Iowa Select Farms, an Iowa farming business that markets more than 5 million hogs per year. She grew on a live, her family's livestock farm, uh, raising pigs and row crops. And uh, we're looking forward very much to your testimony. So, uh, Ms. Jen Sorensen, would you please open? Good morning, Chairman Costa, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on U.S. pork producers' trade policies. I'm the Communications Director for Iowa Select Farms in West Des Moines, Iowa, and President of the National Pork Producers Council which represents the, ish, the interests of over 60,000 pork producers across the United States. Exports are crucial to the U.S. pork industry. Last year, we exported nearly $8 billion of pork, and those exports accounted for a third of the average price received for every hog marketed, or $56. Those exports also supported well over 100,000 American jobs. The past few years have been incredibly difficult for hog farmers after more than three years of trade retaliation that limited pork producers ability to compete effectively around the globe. The COVID pandemic unleashed unprecedented challenges for the entire food supply chain. We've largely bounced back and US pork exports are on track to hit record highs, but still face some challenges. Our exporting success can be largely attributed to high market access outcomes negotiated under free trade agreements. U.S. pork exports have increased more than 1,800% in value and over 1,700% in volume since 1989, the year the United States implemented its FDA with Canada and started opening international markets for value-added ag products. Not only to FDA slash tariffs, they also are a great avenue for U.S. agricultural science-based standards to be accepted and for broader non-tariff market access issues to be resolved. Policies that foster the free flow of goods and expand export markets, mostly through FDAs, are critical to the continued success of America's pork producers, U.S. agriculture, and the overall American economy. The bottom line is the United States needs more FDAs, which eliminate or significantly reduce tariffs and non-tariff barriers to U.S. exports. U.S. pork producers have four trade priorities. First, preventing African swine fever from reaching our shores. An ASF outbreak in the U.S. would have catastrophic effects on U.S. pork domestically and abroad and would negatively affect other protein sectors such as corn and soy. This is why it is imperative we focus on prevention and planning. Second, better market access for U.S. agriculture in Asia through the negotiations of FTAs, including entering the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. Recently, we've seen some successes in the Asia-Pacific region. 
Vietnam agreed to give better market access to U.S. pork through the reduction of tariffs. Vietnam agreed to reduce the MFN tariffs for frozen pork from 15% to 10% with the reduction to enter into force on July 1st, 2022. We are encouraged by the negotiations with Vietnam and hope they lead to broader trade discussions. We wanna thank the 70 plus members of Congress who signed the letter urging for these reductions in tariffs. Similarly, the Philippine government announced it would increase its minimum access volume, its quota, and slash tariffs on pork to curb food price inflation caused by ASF outbreaks in that country. Since then, our exports there have increased by over 100%. Third, we welcome the recent announcement that the U.S. and EU have come to an agreement on the Section 232 steel and aluminum tariffs. We hope this leads to similar negotiations with China, ultimately eliminating the 25% retaliatory duty assessed by China on U.S. pork. And fourth, we must do more as a nation to address the severe supply chain issues affecting all parts of the U.S. economy. We are witnessing enormous backlogs at ports throughout the country. We hope to see swift passage of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2021, which will address some of the issues plaguing U.S. exports. However, our supply chain issues go well beyond the ports as we face tremendous labor shortages that affect not only our farms, but all aspects of the food chain. In conclusion, Expanding access to new and existing markets is critical to the success and future growth of our industry. U.S. pork producers need Congress and the administration to work together to quickly address these issues, enabling hog farmers to continue contributing to the rural and overall U.S. economy. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to questions. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Sorensen, for your uh, focused uh, testimony. and. Uh, uh, I, I will say that uh, the efforts of this subcommittee and other members uh, on the uh, critical challenges facing supply chain, um, I really look at in two categories, and that's one, short-term things that we can do to remedy the situation and, and long-term efforts. Uh, the legislation that we've referenced and that you noted uh, that uh, Congressman Garamendi is carrying, I think is very important. I put that more in the longer term, along with the president's signing of the infrastructure package that will allow us an opportunity to expand our, our ports and harbors. But there's other parts of the supply chain that more immediately need our addressing in terms of uh, the ability to make uh, 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 trucking available and other f efforts to, uh, to get these goods uh, to, uh, to ports. So it's all of the above, both the short term and the long term that we need to be focused on. And uh, we're gonna try everything we can to focus on those comments that you made. So thank you very much. I'd like to now uh, defer to my colleague, uh, the ranking member here from South Dakota to introduce our fifth and final witness who happens to be a constituent of his, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And yes, our next witness uh, is, uh, is a South Dakotan and I wanna just share two thoughts about him. First off, he has a tremendous legacy of leadership on the farm. He is the fourth generation on the farm and he's done a good job of raising the fifth. And I have to say, I've mentioned the sixth generation uh, coming up behind him as well. I have been on uh, his family's land and uh, he has taught me uh, about the impacts of drought on, on soybeans and on corn uh, there on his property. And it is a remarkable uh, legacy of leadership on the farm. But there's also a remarkable family legacy in advocacy. Uh, he is appearing before you today as president of the American Soybean Association. And he's done a good job in the last year on that front. But uh, you shouldn't be surprised uh, when I mention that his son, Jordan, is the president of the South Dakota Soybean Association. Uh, I guess they, uh, I, clearly the, that acorn didn't fall very far from the tree. But by the way, it's Jordan's birthday today. So uh, thank you to our witness for taking time away from, uh, from his son. So without any further ado, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm happy to introduce Mr. Kevin Scott, uh, the president of the American Soybean Association. Well, that's an excellent introduction, my friend. And um, obviously you can extend to the uh, by the entire subcommittee a happy birthday wish to your son. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Please begin. Uh, Chairman Costa, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the House Ag Committee, Livestock and Foreign Ag Subcommittee. 
It's an honor to testify before you today on trade policy and priorities of American soybean growers. My name is Kevin Scott, and I am a soybean farmer from South Dakota. I also have the privilege of serving as president of the American Soybean Association, which represents U.S. Farm soybean farmers on national policy matters. International trade is a pillar of U.S. soybean industry. More than 50% of the U.S. soy was exported to foreign markets last year. Continued access to existing markets and new ones is critical to our long-term success. We need your support and the administration's support to assure the free, fair trade that will keep U.S. soy farmers competitive. In the time allowed, I'd like to discuss a few of our key, key pri trade priorities though a full account can be found in my written testimony. Let me begin with China. China is the largest importer of soybeans in the world and by far the biggest export market for U.S. soy. In 2021 and, 20, and, 20 and 21, China imported almost 32 million metric tons of soy from the U.S. Exports to Mexico, our second largest export market, was just under 5 million metric tons by comparison. We, re we represent more than 35% of China's soy imports, with one in three rows of beans grown in the U.S. shipped to China to fill that demand. However, as the committee is aware, U.S. soybean exports to China came to a halt during the 2018 trade war. At the height of disruption, U.S. soy's footprint in the Chinese market reached a little over 12%. The same year, Brazilian imports captured nearly 75% of the China market. Soy growers began building the China market for U.S. beans more than 40 years ago. They are keenly aware of what it takes to establish new markets, and likewise, that markets once lost are extremely difficult to rebuild. The China Phase 1 deal has been critical to providing relief from retaliatory tariffs levied by China on U.S. soybean imports, but the agreement expires after 2021. There is still work to be done, particularly regarding ag biotech, which has been a major barrier to bringing new soybean traits to U.S. producers. We encourage USTR to hold China accountable to its biotech commitments made under the Phase I agreements. U.S. soybean growers need predictability and certainty that we can retain market access in China. The past several years have been extremely difficult for our industry, and we are now faced with, forced to compete with Brazil and Argentina, who, recognizing our trade friction with China, increased soy production and cut into global markets well beyond China. Turning to Mexico and the importance of free trade agreements, under NAFTA, U.S. soybean exports to Mexico tripled, and again, Mexico is now our number two export market. When President Trump announced his, his intent to renegotiate NAFTA, ASA's ask was, do no harm. We were pleased USMCA maintained our existing market access, but recent events in Mexico are concerning. The government has not approved a, biotech, a new biotech product for import since 2018, and recently it rejected a pending biotech corn application without scientific justification. These actions are contrary to ag biotech provisions in USMCA to which Mexico committed, provisions we feel are the gold standard. Right now, U.S. soybean exports to Mexico are unhindered, but the consequences of these actions or lack thereof could impact future trade. If new seed varieties cannot get approval in both Mexico and China, Developers may decide not to commercialize new traits. <clears throat> we urge President Biden to address these issues directly with President Lopez Obrador. The U.S. was once a leader in establishing new free trade agreements, but our last new free trade agreement entered into force in 2012, despite the U.S. having negotiated the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That's nearly 10 years of inactivity for codified market expansion that could have helped U.S. agriculture. While the U.S. remains idle, our international competitors forged ahead. <clears throat> Six new and significant regional trade agreements now include preferential tra tariff treatment for ag pr products from our competitors. We encourage the administration to negotiate re-entry re into CPTPP and for USTR to use FTAs to maximize our strategic, strategic position in the global economy and give U.S. agriculture much-needed market access 
in emerging markets. Last, we'd love to see a doubling of MAP and FMD funds. This only scratches the surface of ASA's trade priorities. Again, a full list is in my written testimony. Thank you sincerely for holding this hearing and the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Scott, for your uh, focused testimony. And uh, as uh, we begin to set the table um, next year for the reauthorization of the Farm Bill, your comments and Mr. Stinnerup's comments as it relates to the, uh, the uh, market access program and the success that we've had. Uh, I remember back in 2008 and, and 10 as we tried to expand its efforts. And so certainly I think there are opportunities here and I think it was timely for you to note them in your testimony. Um, we have now gotten to that part of the hearing uh, where members will be allocated uh, five minutes, as I said earlier, alternating between Republicans and Democrats to make comments and ask questions. And uh, I will take the prerogative of the chair to begin and to um, use uh, my time to, to make some uh, uh, questions and comments uh, that I think uh, you posed uh, by the testimony you've given. Um, the uh, uh, efforts, uh, uh, Mr. Stinderup, uh, uh, you talked about the unique challenges of specialty crops, which uh, we in California, uh, as you know, like to think uh, uh, we, we do as well as anyone in the world. Uh, but what, what unique challenges do you see in terms of trade that we can better focus our efforts uh, to maintain a competitive edge, Mr. Russ? Uh, Kent, are you there? Yes, I, yes, I am, um, <clears throat> Chairman Costa. And thank you for the question. Especially, especially crops have a unique challenge in, in that they're, I'm not going to say up against the program commodities, but that's basically what it is, particularly when it comes to MAP funding. And since you almost asked me, I too believe that we should double the MAP funding from the, I believe it's at 200 million now and it should be easily, it could be utilized at $400 million. And I truly believe that. <clears throat> the unique challenges for specialty crops are just so many specialty crops. They don't have the infrastructures themselves to, to promote and distribute like the, uh, the program crops, the larger commodities. So uh, we've had, you know, with Sonny Purdue, and now yeah. we've had good good experience now also with the, the current administration as far as recogni recognition of specialty crops. Let's keep Especially that thought in mind as we proceed uh, with the reauthorization next year and build a coalition of support for that effort. Uh, Mr. Vanderwood, uh, you uh, have uh, in your testimony talked about uh, the importance of our trade agreements, not just with our neighbor to the south, uh, Mexico, but also with Canada. The challenges we've had with dairy exports. Uh, um, uh, Mexico, of course, is one of the larger importers of, of white cheese. And of course, we, as was noted, uh, our periodic problems with, uh, with Canada. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking there's an opportunity here, though, and it's always been a challenge with European Union. Uh, how do we get past these inclusion of geographical indicators and trade agreements between the EU and other trading partners? that impact our dairy industry? So yeah, it, it's been a common practice of uh, the EU to use GIs in, in a lot of their free trade agreements and uh, which in effect just locks us out uh, by uh, the, the products that we produce here in the US uh, with common, what we consider to be common food names. Um, they get those locked out in uh, so many other countries that uh, we, we lose access to those countries with those products. and. And uh, if you take a, a, a Gouda and you try to sell it as a, a Garma cheese or something, nobody's going to know what it is. They, they, you know, they, they all know it's, it's Gouda. Uh, they all know that it's, it's uh, Brie, Brie or whatever. And so um, it has been a common practice of the EU to uh, uh, slap those into their free trade yeah. agreements with other countries. Well, I, in another capacity, I work with members of the European Union, and I'm suggesting that maybe we look at getting their, our counterpart of the... Uh, committee jurisdiction in the European Parliament to meet with ours to really see if we can get past the politics and work through some of this. Uh, exactly. Ms. Redhouse, you mentioned in your testimony that some longstanding policy and administrative problems need to be remedied for native producers to be able to have access to international markets. I assume that's why you're in Doha. 
Uh, do you have anything specific you want to talk about to that access? Oh yeah, um, definitely. So one of the, the biggest um, hurdles, but I also should start off with echoing um, Kent and um, Simon's um, deep appreciation for the market access program as a, a recipient of MAP. It has been really helpful in increasing our visibility um, with different uh, international markets. But the but what we're trying to advocate on behalf of our constituents is to increase tribal producers' presence on the world ag stage. Um, and some of our producers do have trouble with um, meeting different re regulation requirements or different labeling requirements. It is a huge hurdle um, to uh, cover costs for a lot of those um, specific activities. And so I think um, most often our producers find that as just one of the biggest challenges to enter the international marketplace. Thank you. Um, uh, two of the previous witnesses made reference to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and uh, I think that was a missed opportunity, um, and suggested that uh, we reconsider re-engaging with uh, the TPP. Um, uh, are, are your organizations prepared to support that effort formally? Uh, dairy, dairy is uh, willing to support that, definitely. Mr. S uh, Stenderup? Yes, I, I agree with the, the re reinventing of the TPP also. Thank you. Well, my time has expired, and I uh, will recognize uh, my colleague from South Dakota, Mr. Uh, Dusty Johnson, for five minutes. Yes, I'll ask the same question to Mr. Scott, Ms. Sorensen, and Mr. Vanderwoody, and they can respond in that order with about 45 seconds or less apiece, if they could. Uh, first off, I just want to know for your, your uh, products where you think the best opportunity for expanding market access via free trade agreements would be. And then secondarily, if there's a particular marketplace where you feel like producers have been disadvantaged uh, because uh, countries in Europe or Asia have not stood still, they've advanced free trade agreements with other marketplaces, and as a result, America is at a relative disadvantage. Talk to us about what, what those marketplaces would be. So, uh, Mr. Scott. Well, yeah, it, expanding those markets is critical, and we kind of figured that out uh, when the tariffs hit uh, uh, from China, uh, shut us down into that market, which was taking uh, a huge per portion of our market. We decided then that um, diversifying our, our basket, uh, putting our eggs in all, not in that one, all, all one basket were, was important. And uh, so we have been pushing hard to uh, develop other economies and markets um, in, in the, the Asian continent, uh, all over um, African continent, uh, uh, even, even some of the European markets that uh, had been, we'd been shut out of previously, we want to uh, continue to push for those. So market access uh, and uh, uh, development is, is, is critical for us. Is there one top priority you think USTR should be most focused on relative to soybeans? Well, I... <clears throat> So soybeans are a fantastic protein source, supply of uh, protein for especially uh, uh, protein deficient countries. Um, and so uh, where there is a need for um, building uh, human health, uh, those, are, those are critical issues for us and we, uh, we want to supply that need. Ms. Sorensen. Yes, thank you. I, I'd start off by saying, you know, our U.S. exports into China are still faced with a 25% retaliatory duty um, when our competitors are faced with only 8%. Secondly, we, we support entering TPP or CBTPP if tariffs are reduced. So we're very passionate about entering into this trade agreement. It has significant market potential for U.S. pork producers, especially given the numbers of countries at the table and the 50 million consumers um, that are part of the agreement. So, you know, yesterday's announcement on Vietnam was progress, uh, that tariff will be reduced to 10%, but CBTPP countries are at 7.5% and will be reduced to 5.6% in 2022, uh, putting uh, U.S. pork at a disadvantage. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Vanderwoody. Yeah, I will say uh, for us, uh, uh, China is definitely uh, uh, it's everyone's market. Uh, we're at a we have a thirty percent tariff rate quota there compared to New Zealand at zero. 
So that's a big one. Vietnam used to be our largest customer for milk powders. Uh, today, we have been locked out of that country due to uh, tariff rate quotas. Uh, Southeast Asia is our target, especially coming from the West Coast for California dairies and Dairy America. Uh, uh, Asia is our target uh, for uh, trade agreements. And uh, we have been, the TPP was something we worked very hard on. And uh, we hope that can be resurrected at some point um, to at least gain access to some of those countries. So if Southeast Asia is the is the most key market, Mr. Vanderwoody, uh, from a dairy perspective, do we feel like the administration has been proactive enough in advancing uh, FTAs in, in that region? No, no, not at this point. And then doubling back to uh, Ms. Sorensen, I think you gave a great answer about China and the disparate tariffs there. Are you getting much of a sense that we're making progress vis-a-vis uh, -vis reducing those retaliatory tariffs uh, from China on pork? You know, the phase one agreement in ASF has created a really large demand for pork around the world. But I, I, I continue to say the, the problem that needs a resolution is our trade retaliatory tariff of 25% on US pork. Again, we face a 33% tariff where our competitors face eight. And that's our biggest setback right, right now is, as we look at the opportunity that we have in China. And so when pork talks to the administration, do you get a sense that they've got some urgency behind resolving that issue, ma'am? No. Very good. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, Chairman's time has expired. Uh, the uh, chair will now recognize the uh, gentlewoman from Virginia, Abigail Spanberger. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much to our witnesses for being here today. Uh, this this hearing is a very timely one, and so I'm grateful for uh, your testimony and the answers to our questions. Across central Virginia, I have heard from dairy farmers, cattlemen, livestock producers, small business owners, and families trying to buy a gallon of milk um, and about the challenges that they are facing in day-to-day in, in -day related to so many of the uh, disruptions that we've seen in the supply chain. Um, one way that we know we can reduce uh, supply chain bottlenecks is by supporting uh, free and fair trade policies that protect American workers and businesses and reduce the barriers of the flow of goods across the globe. Uh, that's why I was proud to work alongside my House colleagues and the former administration to help secure bipartisan support ultimately for the passage of the USMCA last Congress. And so as this deal continues to be implemented, I want to make sure that we're uh, working to uh, to confirm that all uh, parties are upholding their end of the deal. Um, and, and to that end, uh, Mr. Van Der Wode, um, I would ask a question of you first. Central Virginia is home to many dairy farms um, and, and certainly um, uh, they are facing significant challenges as the industry is across the board. Um, and I share your concerns related to the enforcement of the dairy provisions in that deal. And so my question for you is what more could Congress be doing to support the industry and ensure that all, um, um, uh, all parties live up to their commitments in that deal? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, the decision to doesn't have a big impact, but for my counterparts in the Northeast and the upper Midwest, it's a big deal. Uh, we strongly support um, the we strongly support the, the the dispute settlement process, and uh, we appreciate the bipartisan congressional backing that ultimately led to that step. Uh, it's not only the enforcement area that we need to see action on, though. For instance, in Mexico, overly burdensome regulatory proposals threaten to disrupt trade. In Colombia, they're weighing imposing higher tariffs that would derail our free trade agreement on milk powder exports. So this happens not just with Canada and Mexico, it's happening all over the place. And we appreciate the support we've gotten from uh, the USTR office thus far, uh, but we continue to need um, not only support, but action. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. And, and certainly uh, I would love to, to follow up in the future if there's any other 
priorities or suggestions that you, your organization um, have into the future. Um, I do have a second question for you and ultimately um, for Ms. Sorensen. As Mr. Vandervuda, in your testimony, you mentioned supply chain challenges and the need to pass the Ocean Shipping Reform Act. I am proud to co-sponsor this bill. I believe and I think broadly people agree that it will do a lot to reduce port congestion. But beyond this bill, are there other actions that you would suggest that Congress uh, be attuned to or actions that Congress should be taking to contend with these supply chain uh, bottlenecks? Um, and Ms. Sorensen, I would love to have your opinion on this question as well. Yeah, so there are there are some things that, that uh, the administration is considering, such as extending the or um, uh, truck drivers. Um, sir, sir um, you pause for a moment. You, uh, okay. We heard extending. Oh, that's all you got, huh? Okay, sorry, I'm out on a hotel Wi-Fi. So uh, um, extending the hours of operation for truck drivers. Okay. Uh, extending the age limit for truck drivers down to 18, if yeah. possible. Um, extending weight limits. So it's from our infrastructure bill passage. Okay, in yes. That pilot program, yep. Yes, yes. Um, weight limits, um, yeah. and uh, just a lot of, and then here in California, we also have environmental restrictions that are at our ports that maybe could just be loosened for a little while as we have lost access to a lot of equipment uh, due to cancellations and that sort of stuff. Uh, we've had 60% cancellations in the last month. Uh, we are the largest exporter of milk powders uh, in the world, and 60% uh, of our loads got canceled last month, which strands equipment. Um, so we've, we've run out of people and equipment to, to export the products that we need to export. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Sorensen? Yes. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, the supply chain disruptions in particular, the ports are of grave concern to us. Um, we do not want to be potentially viewed as unreliable trading partners. Mm -hmm. Trading relationships are take a long time to form. And we want to deliver a product that has been orders, ordered. So when we're shipping chilled pork, we do not want to have to freeze it down because of a backlog at the ports. I think it goes well beyond the port issues as well. Um, we're also seeing uh, labor challenges throughout our farms, our packing industry, and transportation. And we continue to ask uh, members of Congress for an H-2A program that allows for year-round uncapped labor. Uh, so the, the, the challenges definitely extend beyond the ports through the entire food supply chain. Uh, thank you so much. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for letting me go over a little bit. Um, thank you to our witnesses. And, and certainly, Ms. Sorensen, I hear you loud and clear on the H-2A visa portion. Uh, I think many of us on this committee were strong supporters of the Farm Workforce Modernization Act um, and, and uh, con will continue to advocate for that bill's passage. Um, into the future. So thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Congresswoman Spanberger. Uh, the next member will be Congressman Rouser, followed the next Democrat will be Congressman Harder. Well, thank you much. I've got a, a million things on my mind that I could ask about in limited time, but let me um, uh, bring up the subject uh, that we've not talked a great deal about this morning, but I think is very important. Uh, trade Promotion Authority. Uh, are all of our witnesses in favor of Trade Promotion Authority? Absolutely. Anyone opposed? Let me ask it that way. So that being the case, uh, what priorities uh, do you think should be voiced um, in the discussions between Congress and, and the administration, assuming that uh, those conversations are com uh, commenced at some point? Is there anything about the last trade promotion authority that needs to be uh, modified or changed? In my opinion, uh, you know, trade promotion authority is, uh, is a critical uh, uh, thing that the president has in his back pocket, basically, and can uh, uh, further these free trade agreements. And we've, uh, the Soybean Association has fought for uh, TPA uh, uh, for many years, and uh, we, for every administration, we, we do the same. So it's just uh, something that's good for free trade. Any other uh, witness have a comment? Yeah, I think uh, we would like to encourage that there is uh, maybe a little more interaction between Congress and the administration. Um, that way, uh, nothing gets missed in the process. 
And also to possibly add that the positions that are still not filled, to get them filled and certified, ratified, whatever you have, um, so we can get going on some of these things, particularly with supply chain challenges right now and tariffs. Thank you. Anyone else? I would just think I would agree with my fellow soybean, milk, and almond farmers on their statements. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, Kevin, um, I'm curious, uh, what's the relative number of soybeans that go to China as compared to other markets, such as Mexico and Europe? Uh, so China, <clears throat> China gets 60% of the, uh, the world's uh, soybeans go to China. And uh, from the U.S., it's 30% uh, of our production. Or one, every, one in three rows of our soybeans goes there. So it uh, depends on uh, how much they're getting. But, but uh, Brazil is also the competitor, and, and they would supply that much also or more. And so uh, uh, one in three rows is what we kind of consider. I'm uh, curious, what's the potential of the African market? Uh, for soybean exports. How, how much uh, growth opportunity is there? Well, we are working in Africa. Uh, uh, WISH, which is a world initiative for soy and human health, uh, is, a, is a group of, uh, uh, that works with a, a ASA. And uh, they are in Ghana at, currently, and they had been a five-year project there. Uh, developing their uh, soy aquaculture and uh, 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 poultry uh, uh, mission there. And uh, we are basically, uh, WISH starts the program. They get, uh, get the country ready for uh, actually knowing what a soybean is, how to use it, uh, and how to improve their uh, protein production and uh, egg production. Those kinds of things uh, are all fantastic for human health. And, and uh, that's where we start. And then we have uh, another marketing organization that takes over uh, when, the commercial, when it's a commercially viable business. Uh, Ms. Sorensen, um, what has been your level? <clears throat> Excuse me. What has been your level of involvement in USDA discussions as to how uh, the department uh, plans to use the CCC funding set aside for African uh, swine fever prevention and preparedness? And uh, are you confident the funds uh, will be put to the highest priority use? Uh, bring us up to date on anything you may know there. Yeah. Um Thank you for the question. USDA has indeed shared their preliminary plans on how they plan to utilize the funds. Um, you know, we understand their top priority is to minimize the risk of African swine fever from moving into the mainland, uh, which definitely aligns with the top priority of the industry. We're grave concern of African swine fever landing on our shores. Um, we support utilizing those funds to enhance the capability of our national animal health laboratory network, uh, increase the inventory of equipment for large animal depopulation and disposal uh, in the national veterinary stockpile. Uh, this is a critical need for the industry. And we're confident the USDA priorities align with our priorities. That's good to hear. Um, Mr. Scott, real quick, going back. Uh, when China cut everything off for soybeans, uh, were there any other markets uh, that uh, you really made some headway with or began to uh, get a foothold in, and then my time's expired? Well, sure. It, um, thank you for the question. It, <clears throat> so when China um, shut down our imports, uh, it, of course, crashed our market. And so uh, people become very interested in a, in a cheap source of protein. And at that time, uh, our prices were not very good. It wasn't great for U.S. soy farmers, but uh, uh, Egypt developed a, a fantastic um, uh, soy aquaculture, uh, so feeding fish. They feed fish, and uh, uh, and they, they were a, a big improvement in market. But uh, also all the, the Asian countries, um, uh, Taiwan, uh, also... Uh, uh, Vietnam, uh, just many others, uh, took advantage actually of the supply of soybeans and uh, it, it developed a great market and we have tried to foster those markets and continue in them. Thank you, Ayur. Mr. Harder, your five minutes. Terrific. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Johnson, and, and thank you, Chairman Costa, for holding this hearing. It's great to see all our witnesses here today on, on such an important issue. 
uh, as Chairman Costa knows well, the Central Valley uh, that we both represent, our, our ag relies heavily on trade and exports to, to thrive. I mean, we are the fruit and nut basket, not just of California and not just of the whole nation, but of the world. And so we need to make sure that we're getting our products to market in order to make sure that we can continue to succeed. Um, I really appreciated uh, the testimony from uh, Mr. Vandewada uh, that he shared that these supply cha chain challenges that we're facing right now just in the dairy industry are costing a billion dollars in additional expenses just in the first seven months of this year. Uh, the neighbors that, that we have in the, in the valley simply can't afford that. So huge uh, excitement to have this hearing talking about some of the situations at our ports and I know we're, we're working hard to make sure that we resolve those. Um, would love just to, to hear a little bit more from Mr. Va Vanderwada. It's wonderful having California dairies represented, and uh, it's, it's great to see you, sir. I appreciated the tour of your dairy uh, uh, a few weeks or, or months ago and walked away very impressed by your operation. I'm very grateful for your, for your hospitality, and thank you so much for your testimony today. I I'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, some of the markets that you think Congress and this administration could be focused on that we're not uh, focused on today. I know you mentioned a little bit in that testimony. What are the top priority markets for, for you and the dairy industry at this moment? Yeah, so I think uh, once we pulled out of TPP last, you know, recently, um, we did make a deal with, with Japan last year. Um, and we as California felt we got short suited in that one. Um, we, we are large producers of butter and, and dried milk powder. Uh, when you have milk, you can either turn it into cheese or you can turn it into butter and milk powder. And, and we, we make butter and milk powder and we were locked out of that Japan free trade agreement. Uh, we want to make sure that as those, if those one-on-one -on -one agreements happen, uh, all milk is included. And Japan was very strategic in, uh, blocking us. Uh, we, we didn't think that was a very fair, um, way to go to go about it. So we need the full bucket of milk in any free trade agreement. Obviously, um, Southeast Asia from Western ports makes a lot of sense. Uh, China's kind of the, the 500 pound gorilla in the room. We all know they're hard to deal with, but we need to keep working with them to try to find some way to get our products in there and try to get at least closer to uh, the advantages that New Zealand is where most of our products go today. And uh, there's there's way there's a lot more access for us there if we can get some um, some better access. Just to dive deeper on Japan, I saw a few hours ago that the administration announced um, a framework for for those discussions. Uh, I guess it's still a little early to see how that uh, will will develop, but. What are your concerns if we do not continue to develop our dairy trade with Japan? Uh, what do you think are the implications and, and um, are there things that we could be doing to, to be helpful, especially in light of this new framework? Implications are just, I mean, that's all market access, you know, for everybody around the world. We're all fighting for the same markets. Um, uh, Japan is one that makes a lot of sense for us. Uh, so obviously we, we want more access to that, that market. Um, they can afford our products. They want our products. Uh, we, we would like to sell them our products. Um, you know, we're, we're really good at making these things sustainably and efficiently. Um, we, we need to get access to those. We, we've done everything we can at home. We need some help from, from our, our legislators and, and trade ambassadors and that sort of stuff. We, we've worked with, we've been actively engaged in, in trade negotiations uh, throughout the years. So we would like to continue to be there. Terrific. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Stinderup, uh, same question to you for our, our almond industry. Um, what do you think are some of the biggest barriers that our almond industry is facing when it comes to market access? And how do you think congressional programs like the, the Market Access Program or others can, can help or, or achieve some of the trade objectives that you have? Well, you've heard that, oh, by the way, uh, member Harder, you see I'm wearing a red and blue tie today. Well, you and I had that discussion a few months ago. I love it. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> And that's, and that's very important today. Um, whether I, I tried to interject a little earlier, um, almonds are faced with a 55% tariff into China. That's overwhelming. Our, our number one competitor, Australia, has a 0% tariff. They have somewhat of a free trade agreement, and we're facing that. And China is a burgeoning market. It's, as far as market access, their middle class is coming up. and. <clears throat> You know what a great what a great area to, for us to to continue towards. 
uh, with our friends at USTR and, and Congress themselves working towards, you know, reducing something as ridiculous as a 55 percent tariff. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I see I'm, I'm, I'm out of time, but thank you so much for your comments, and I yield back to the chair. We thank Representative Harder for his uh, good line of questioning and the good job that he does representing the folks in, in the San Joaquin Valley. Kent, uh, I'm glad you noted the 55% surcharge uh, with regards to almonds, or as we say almonds, uh, because given the current prices uh, for, for almonds, uh, that would make a big difference. Um, I believe our next um, uh, member uh, to be recognized is Representative Barry Moore from Alabama. Mr. Moore, are you, are you there? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And uh, Ranking Member Johnson, thank you for having us here today. Following up on Ms. Bamberger's question, there have been serious concerns with supply chain stability across multiple industries since COVID-19 pandemic began. For any witnesses, what is the administration doing that is working and maybe even not working? If the administration was represented here today, what would you suggest? I'm sorry, who is the question directed at? Any of the, in, okay. any of the panelists, I just kind of want to I, open I'd it. Like to, I'd like hand. to make one succinct comment. We don't want the foreign markets accustomed to functioning without U.S. products. You know, whether it's just for a couple of months or, you know, a part of a year. Now we're talking 2023 20, before things may return to normal. My goodness, they can, uh, they can forget about us quickly. And these, that's, it's that simple. So, Kent, what do you think? How do we get, how do we make a presence felt? In other words, I understand what you're saying. Once they get used to using another supplier and they get logistics worked out, it's tough to go back and use and re kind of reestablish those logistic chains. How do you, what do you suggest we do in the immediate to, to help you? You know, we're, we're faced with these diverged charges and such, and these ships are going back empty. They're deadheading back because it's quicker and more profitable for them. Well, Aren't we the United States of America? Let's pull the hammer on, on these people and fill those things. If we have right. available commodities, let's fill them up. Makes sense. Uh, anybody else want to address what they would mention to the administration if they were present today, kind of how we could, what we can do in Congress and of course with the administration to help? Yeah, I would follow up on Kent's comments. We can't wait. Uh, these, are, these are immediate needs. We need Congress to act. We need the Federal Maritime Commission to act. We need we need this Ocean Shipping Reform Act. We need to get creative. We need to think outside the box and do things we haven't done before, uh, whether that's you know mandating something with these international carriers. We all understand these are international carriers coming into our ports. Um, we only have so much control over them, but let's exert any control we can uh, to get our products on those ships heading back to the Middle East and heading back to uh, those other countries. Thank you, Simon. Anybody else uh, want to comment on that? I... Well, we certainly, okay, I... uh, it, it, excuse me. Go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, we, uh, we ship currently about 5% of the soybeans we produce in the U.S. and export uh, go in containers. And uh, those containers fit uh, the smaller markets that don't have the, um, the deep uh, ports, so the large ships can't make it in with their bulk commodities. And uh, so it fits quite well that uh, those containers uh, can go to these smaller ports. And uh, we have plenty of soybeans to fill those containers. Uh, so uh, if, uh, if we can get it figured out, that would be a fantastic, um, uh, just to go along with the rest of your comments, that would be a fantastic way to fill those ships. Thank you. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back, and we thank him for his line of questioning. And the chair will now recognize the uh, gentleman from Illinois, uh, Representative Bobby Rush. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is directed to Mr. Senator. Uh, Mr. Senator, I was delighted to learn that Blue Diamond Growers is a co-op and uh, with over 6,000 members in California. In your testimony, you also mentioned that 90% of uh, California's Amman farms are multi-generational family farms. Uh, as I had the opportunity to discuss uh, in yesterday's hearing on, on the renewable economy, I, for one, believe that co-ops 
are critical to putting resources directly into the hands of overlooked populations uh, and are a critical way of stopping and even reversing the rapid decline in black farmers. Uh, how many of the blue diamond growers are minorities? Um, can you discuss how blue diamond growers have been able to help black and brown farmers? Thank you, Congressman Rush. Um, I believe as far as the minority aspect and the uh, majority of our membership are Caucasian. Uh, we do have numerous um, Indian Sikh, Sikh farmers and Latinos, um, not too many in the black, the black sector, but um, you know, we're an open, we're an open co-op for all membership. And that just happens to be the type of person, the family farms that grow for there. I appreciate you asking the question. Anything else? Yeah, would you please discuss the best practices Blue Diamond Growers use to help their members succeed and specifically their multi-generational family farmers? And also, uh, I'm also interested in whether or not using co-ops more in urban areas, uh, can these, your practices, your best practices be applied to urban cooperatives? Well, the difference between an urban cooperative and a rural, is that the question? Um, we, we, don't, we don't discriminate as far as that goes. Um, no, uh, specifically, you have a model. And I'm going to think outside the box in terms of your model. The co-op model, I believe, is, has uh, some benefits to urban ag and rural ag. And I want to know, do you agree? And uh, urban uh, uh, farming is in its nation stage. It's can develop. And should we be more interested in using the co-op model? I, I'm a strong advocate of the urban urban farming and urban co-op models, yes, uh, whether it's neighborhood or, or to a larger extent. I'm a strong advocate of that. We spend, um, we, get, we give our share of money as far as urban um, ag education on an annual basis too, uh, bringing the farm to the urban areas. And um, yeah, I'm a true advocate for that. And the, uh, the co-op business model works well for families and whether it be urban or rural. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna switch my line of question. And uh, I've introduced HR 3625, the US Cuba Relations Normalization Act. Mr. Sorensen, do you believe that US pork producers would benefit from increases in trade with Cuba my state is a state that had, uh, had, had, that had a robust trade relationship with Cuba. Cuba uh, contributed much to our trade uh, 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 negotiations, our trade affairs. And I'm interested in what is your opinion on uh, the, uh, on normalizing the trade relationship with Cuba? Um, you know, as a as an industry that exports to over a hundred countries, uh, in exporting nearly twenty five percent of our production, you know, broadening our export portfolio through FTAs and more market access into countries is a top priority for us, and we want access to as many markets as we can get. Um, without having read the language of your bill and your proposal, um, I'd like to refrain from comment, but if it grows our export markets in countries like Cuba and in countries where the consumers love pork and so many do outside of our shores, then we would be in support of that. Well, I, I've heard from a number of uh, Illinois uh, farmers and they they said that they are being hurt because of the restriction uh, from trade 
with Cuba, that they are actually hurting and their farmers are hurting and their bottom line is suffering because of the um, uh, restriction on trade with Cuba. We, we, we uh, thank, thank the you. gentleman from uh, Chicago uh, for your comments and uh, I, I can't speak outside of California, but I know in various efforts in the past, there has been a, a, an interest by California producers as uh, trying to participate in the Cuban market. And uh, clearly um, uh, it's a question I think that is uh, well raised and we thank you for always your participation. The next uh, member that uh, the chair will recognize is Mr. Randy Feenstra, uh, the gentleman from Iowa. Thank you, Chairman Costa and Ranking Member Johnson. Uh, trade is obviously a very key driver in Iowa's economy. As one of the top agricultural producing states in the U.S., it is important that Iowa's productive farmers have access to e export markets. According to the data from the USDA, Iowa agriculture exports totaled more than $11 billion in 2020. My, con my constituents understand that trade is the lifeblood for U.S. farmers. Ms. Sorensen, it's great to have you as a fellow Iowan be before our committee today. Uh, as you well know, my district represents one of the most productive hog uh, productions in, uh, in all of the nation. Your testimony speaks to the point that, that trade access is important, not only for our producers in Iowa, but across our country. The top export markets in the U.S. agriculture, Canada, Mexico, China, the European Union, Japan, account for about 60% of the total value of our trade exports. Agreements negotiated by Trump administration, such as the, the U.S.-Japan Trade Agreement and the U.S.-China Phase One Agreement, sought to update the trade policies in these export markets. Ms. Sorensen, can you share how these agreements have benefited the U.S. pork market? And then also, are there any outstanding issues that we'd like to uh, bring forward uh, to see from the Biden administration? Yeah, thank you for the for the question. Um, the ratification of USMCA, the agreement with Japan, um, the phase one deal with China, despite still having a 25% retaliatory tariff, have all been really helpful getting the U.S. pork industry back on its feet after three years of trade retaliatory tariffs and a COVID pandemic that disrupted the global food supply chain. You know, circling back to our top priorities, we want into CBTPP. There's huge opportunity for us to be a part of that, given the 500 million consumers that are a part of those countries and the number of countries that want to be a part of that trade agreement. We want a level playing field, and we also think it's important to be a part of setting agricultural based standards across the world, growing market access and free trade agreements in a large portfolio of countries is what Iowa and U.S. pork producers need uh, to, to survive and grow our rural and U.S. economy. Th thanks, thanks for those comments. When I met with a representative from Taiwan, I heard that China is spreading disinformation about the U.S. Uh, pork products, such as racto, uh, ractomine uh, in the pork. Uh, Ms. Sorensen, can you share how these non-tariff barriers prohibit market access and any updates on the U.S. efforts to explain the safety of racto, racto means use? Yeah, I mean, ractopamine is an approved, FDA-approved um, feed additive that producers have been using for decades. It's a technology production management tool and innovation like many that U.S. pork producers uh, utilize on their farms. I think this circles back to the key point about, you know, we need to be at the table as part of these agreements to, to, to be engaged in the conversation, be able to set agriculture science-based standards um, for, for exports and trade agreements across the world. Things like banning uh, an approved feed ingredient, ingredient are not good for the competitiveness of U.S. farmers and particular pork producers. Yep, yep. Thank you. And one more question. You know, I'm so passionate about, about the fear of, of African swine fever in the U.S. and especially in, our ho in the hog market because I think this would decimate uh, our export market. 
Do you see, uh, is there anything that we can do, because this would be catastrophic economically to our nation and to obviously the state of Iowa, is there anything that, that you see from the export side or anything that we should do uh, from policy side to address uh, or be stronger when it comes to uh, African swine fever? Absolutely. A third of our hogs are tied to exports. And if we had ASF in the U.S., our exports would stop on day one. It would be absolutely devastating. We've got to have Congress working with the administration to support and fully fund the NALMS lab. Uh, our APHIS veterinary staff need strength, need funding. Our CBP agents and our K-19s protecting our borders. And things like investing dollars for more signage at passenger terminals. Anything we can do to support our ports and our borders. Thank you. Thank you. And I yield back. One moment. Let's go now to uh, Mr. Bacon from Nebraska. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thanks to the ranking member. I appreciate the spirit of which uh, both of you uh, lead this uh, subcommittee. And uh, I would like to highlight, and it may have been highlighted already. By the way, I had an, an ambassador visit, so I had to uh, turn off for a bit. I had to speak kind of floor. So I hope I'm not duplicating comments here, but I may. Uh, but I did want to point out that when it comes to the oversight within the Ag Committee, I don't know that we've done any oversight uh, with the, anybody from the Agriculture Department. I'd like to encourage the majority to do so. And almost all of the committees have not done that in Congress, with the exception of the HAST, the Armed Services Committee, and the Intelligence Committee. And uh, so I just respectfully request that our committee uh, uh, do that. There's, I think there's things that we need to get the Agriculture uh, Department and the leadership here and, and ask them about. Uh, secondly, I'd like to point out too that up until last month, the president has not mentioned trade at all. Uh, he's been silent on this. Now, last month he started to, but I think it should be a higher priority uh, for this administration. Uh, Nebraska is an export state, and we need a, a president fighting to open up doors uh, for our, our, uh, our protein and uh, grain products there. So I wanted to point that out as well. So my first question uh, is really to uh, Ms. Swartzen and Mr. Scott. How are we doing with the phase one deal with China? Is China meeting their agreement. We'll start off with Mrs. Swartzen. <laughs> I was gonna say, I guess I'll take a run at that. Um, you know, the China phase one and having ASF sadly ravage the pork industry in China has indeed created a, a very large demand for pork around the world and an opportunity for the US pork industry. You know, the problem remains that we need a resolution to the trade retaliatory disputes with China. So we are still faced with a 25% retaliatory tariff, totaling 33% tariff, 8% for the most favored nations, an additional 25% place on, place on the U.S. pork producers. Um, this, we need to have a level playing field and be able to take advantage of the opportunity that we have um, with China. You know, as long as those tariffs remain in place, we are at a significant disadvantage to other nations supplying pork into the country. And, you know, they're increasingly seeking pork imports because at least a one, a one third of its production has been impacted by African swine fever. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Scott, what about the uh, soybean side of this? Yeah, it, um, of course, Jen's um, comments are appropriate. We, uh, <clears throat> most of our soybean imports into China go to feed hogs. And uh, when, they're, when they had African swine fever, there was not a, a big need for them to import soy. And, uh, and so they put tariffs on, and it was, it was basically an artificial uh, tariff to us because they were not going to import him, uh, soybeans anyway. And, uh, but when they did start to, uh, it, when there was a demand for soybean and feed, uh, hog feed in China, uh, they somehow uh, allow those tariffs to go away on the soybean side. And uh, uh, we, in, in the American Soybean Association, would prefer to feed our chickens and our, our, our hogs and, and uh, animals here and then ship, ship the meat uh, to China. And so uh, removing uh, tariffs on the, on, the, on the pork side would be fantastic for soybeans. And so we, uh, we are for those uh, reduced tariffs also. Thank you. And uh, Mrs. Sor Ms. Sorensen, you mentioned a little bit about African swine fever and the impact on the pork industry if it broke out here. Are we doing enough in the research here? What more should we be doing 
uh, to fund research uh, when it comes to combating this. We will never turn down funding and a focus on agriculture research if it helps us strengthen our borders and helps producers prevent and plan for an ASF outbreak or any FAD outbreak uh, in the United States. Again, it would be devastating to farmers in the entire rural economy if we were faced with a foreign animal disease, including our friends in corn and soybean that supplied us, supply us feedstuffs. Um, again, would be devastating in prevention, planning, preparation, uh, and research would tie into being able to help producers seek um, the best methods, including depopulation and funding our veterinary stockpiles and veterinary and funding our veterinary uh, veterans over APHIS is also critical. Thank you. I'd like to ask you about foot mouth disease vaccine bank. It was my initiative, but I'm going to be out of time, and I hope this will become operational this year yep. and uh, that we can see the uh, positive results of this vaccine bank. But with that, uh, I yield back. Uh, the gentleman yields back. His time has expired, and the uh, chair will recognize the next member in the subcommittee, but I want to let those uh, members and, and, and staff members that are uh, participating uh, remotely that uh, we are um, about to conclude the, uh, the hearing, so uh, for members who have maybe missed their opportunity, this is going to be uh, near your time. Uh, I uh, want to recognize Representative uh, Jim Hegeldorn from Minnesota uh, for uh, your five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, Ranking Member, appreciate it. Um, thank you, witnesses, for being here. Under, uh, under President Trump, I thought some of the things we did right for agriculture were to try to reset some of the basic principles to help our farmers lower taxes, get rid of some regulations that lowered cost of production, have energy independence, which kept the price of fuel and electricity, fertilizer, everything down, and then uh, try to reset some of these trade deals that for a while maybe had gone too far. And uh, at USMCA is a very good example, I think, of one of the trade deals that was very excellent, and of course, uh, China won and trying to do what we could there and to reset that where they were manipulating currency and they were uh, forcing technology transfers, stealing our intellectual property and things like that. I think for the, the you know, the, the main point of that, it was going the right direction, COVID hit, and there was a little bit of a issue there, but we're on the right track. What concerns me about the Biden administration, and I think my colleague just mentioned it, I mean, up until just recently, the word trade hasn't even been in their vocabulary. They're really not working on this at all, and I'm not sure exactly when they're going to get to it. Our Republican members on this committee have asked the, uh, the trade rep, uh, Kathleen Tai, to uh, come by and talk to us about it, give us, uh, give us an update. She says she's not available until sometime next year. Well, you know, a quarter of the administration will be over by the time she wants to come up and even talk a little bit about trade. So I'll open this up to Mr. Scott and Ms. Sorensen, but what do you think the administration could be doing more right now to be a little bit more active in the, in the trade area? Hmm. <clears throat> Excellent question. Uh, <laughs> of course, uh, talking about um, MAP and FMD would be great. Uh, I think those things are uh, critical to our, uh, um, our success in other countries, uh, but trade, uh, needing to get the, the, the people in place uh, that can actively work for ag's interest. And uh, we, we, um, we need those positions so that uh, we have something to bounce off of uh, as far as our conversations with the administration and, uh, and so that they can go out and, uh, and forward the, um, the needs of trade. I mean, it, critically, uh, soybean industry focuses on trade. Uh, we have to, and that uh, uh, we are pretty good doing it um, um, ourselves. Uh, we, we work in other countries, but uh, there is also uh, a definite need for uh, uh, the administration's help in, in uh, getting access to uh, certain markets and, and playing fair. And I know Jen has brought up uh, uh, the scientific um, 
data that, that is used or the non-scientific data and basically to, to put up uh, artificial barriers to us and, and those things need to be addressed uh, constantly and uh, because there is considerably t uh, a lot of time spent uh, in foreign countries coming up with ways to inhibit our uh, exports from the U.S. So uh, we definitely need an engaged administration. Well, but before Ms. Sorensen's answers, I, I, a lot of that takes, it takes a lot of work. They have to get together and they negotiate and we have to pound on them and and make those agreements, and I'm, I'm just not seeing the work. That's that's the sad thing. Ms. Sorensen, what, uh, what's your perspective on, on trade and what the administration's been up to so far? You know, I would, I would start off by saying we're thankful for the administration's um, engagement in Vietnam and the Philippines. We've had our eyes on these markets for years, um, and so increasing market access into those countries will be very beneficial for U.S. pork producers consumers in those countries love pork. Um, you know, I go back to the need to join CBTPP. That would be an immediate um, opportunity to look at for U.S. agriculture and U.S. pork. Again, 500 million consumers part of those agreements. And it, we need a level playing field getting into those countries. Um, protection against African swine fever, and just always growing our portfolio through tr free trade agreements and more market access to countries across the globe. I think we can do, we can produce pork sustainably here in the United States. We can produce a quality product and a safe product at a great cost, cost and we need to take advantage of that to grow our rural and U.S. economy. I appreciate that. I mean, our farmers are the most uh, productive and efficient in the world. I grew up on a family farm in southern Minnesota. Farming's changed a lot since then. They do terrific work, uh, but we have to find these markets and we have to have these agreements in order to make sure that our independent and other farmers are gonna remain in business and our community communities can remain vibrant. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and I think uh, from the testimony we received this morning, there seems to be a consensus that we ought to take another look at rejoining the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, and for those of us who felt we shouldn't have left it in the first place, uh, I think we ought to do what we can on a bipartisan basis to urge that to, to happen under conditions that would be acceptable to us, obviously. Um, and, you know, I, I'm just reminded uh, that uh, uh, China, uh, that uh, the President had an extensive uh, discussion with yesterday with President Xi. Uh, for this administration, like the previous administration, like the administration for us, is always a challenge because China is an adversary, China is a competitor, and China is also a immense market opportunity. And uh, so every administration that's had to deal with China uh, that likes to be a part of the world uh, trade effort but not always follow the, the rules uh, required uh, makes it um, uh, perplexing for any administration to, to, to do so, but we must because uh, for all the reasons that I just described. I think the welcome news today uh, with this new initiative with Japan will create more opportunities. With that said, um, our next uh, member is uh, Representative Johanna Hayes from Connecticut, and then followed by Representative uh, Plaskett from the U.S. Virgin Islands. And uh, if the chair does not uh, hear any other members that are in queue, we will bring the uh, hearing to a close. So uh, Representative Hayes from Connecticut. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for holding this hearing. I've been hearing from Connecticut producers about cost increases and operation impediments caused by global supply chain disruptions. For some, this has become so burdensome that they are contemplating closing their doors permanently. That outcome, if widespread, would be disastrous for my state because we have many small family farmers. I'm glad we have a chance to explore this further today. Generally, trade policy is extremely important to Connecticut agricultural producers. According to the latest available data from the United States Trade Representatives, Connecticut exported about $248 million in agricultural goods, mainly to Asia and Europe in 2017. Given that my state has a substantial dairy industry, I am extremely concerned about this issue. So Mr. Vandewater, 
I, I was pleased to support the USMCA in last Congress and was particularly glad to see that the deal opened Canada to U.S. dairy exports. Since its implementation last year, how has USMCA affected dairy trade with Canada? And is Canada adhering to the dairy access agreements in the USMCA? Uh, well, as I said before, I don't think uh, they, they have changed their actions a little bit, uh, but they have not fully um, they have not fully uh, um, acted on uh, the agreements that were put forth in, in the USMCA. So we do ask that the, that Ambassador Tai and the administration um, call them to the table and, and ask for the hearing on um, getting resolution to that, that problem. And I think this kind of ties together what Ms. Sorensen said and the chairman said. What export opportunities might U.S. producers be missing out on because the United States withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership? And to what extent, if at all, would meat and dairy producers benefit if the U.S. were to join the CPTPP? So again, uh, Japan obviously is, is a, a key market for us, uh, but it needs to be a, a fully accessible market uh, for dairy. Um, as I said before, Vietnam used to be our largest customer, and uh, we've been we virtually haven't shipped, been able to ship anything to Vietnam because uh, someone else got a free trade agreement there, and and uh, we had in tariffs imposed on us. So, and that that story just gets told over and over and over throughout the Middle East. Um, we've done what we can to access those markets, uh, but TPP uh, would definitely be very very big for the dairy industry. And lastly, Mr. Vanderwater, you mentioned that exports drive growth and create jobs in the dairy industry. Can an increase in exports help strengthen the fluid milk supply chain? Absolutely. I mean, a rising tide, you know, lifts all boats. Um, so, uh, you know, we 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 have in dairy, we have faced the same labor issues that any other industry out there has faced. Um, we've we've had a really hard time finding enough labor uh, over the last couple of years. And uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone with, as I talk to farmers across the US, uh, they have the same issues. So um, yeah, I think uh, um, we have a fairly secure dairy market here in the US and our domestic supply chain is in very good shape. Um, you know, there were small issues last year, but uh, uh, for the most part, we have the product. It was just a matter of, of getting it into a package or getting it to a store. Uh, that was the problem. So. Um, I think our, our supply chain here in America is very good, and any export opportunities will only enhance that. Thank you. And I will conclude my time the way I always do, just reminding everyone on this committee and, every, and, and all the stakeholders that uh, when we look at the challenges in the industry um, on large corporate scales, just imagine, imagine how those challenges are amplified and, exa and exacerbated for small family farmers, for uh, people who uh, this is their only source of income, who don't have the revenue or the capital to continue through several bad years or bad seasons. So um, I, I just will continue to push on this committee to make sure that any solutions to these problems that we develop does not leave any of those small farmers behind. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. I thank uh, uh, our colleague, uh, the uh uh, representative from Connecticut for her well-spoken uh, uh, comments as it relates to the, um, America's uh, challenge in terms of our maintaining our agricultural competitiveness for uh, farming uh, uh, farmers of all sizes, and I think that's an, an important uh, note. Uh, and the chair will now recognize, uh, I think, our final member to be participating today, and that's uh, Representative Stacy Plaskett from the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, Representative Plaskett. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to the witnesses for being here today and having this conversation with us. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a very important issue to me. Um, I think that trade Paul, it's interesting, uh, being a member of the Agriculture Committee, but also being a member of of the Ways and Means Committee, um, trade policy and priority is something that I think um, quite often about. Uh, and so I wanted to ask some real questions with regard to that. Um, Ms. Latasha Redhouse, I have a question for you. In my home district of the U.S. Virgin Islands, we are particularly cognizant 
of climate change, given our vulnerability to the devastating environmental impacts that it has. Do you have any recommendations on how to implement sustainable agricultural policies while ensuring we provide support to our small business professionals? Yeah, definitely. As, I'm, as you mentioned, um, and I appreciate the question, as you mentioned, the, small, the smaller farmers and producers, patient capital has been um, one thing that we've been exploring and really trying to advocate on behalf of our constituents. Um, and we've been trying to um, really push the, um, you know, share the, the whole aspect of regenerative agriculture and then also inclusion of the uh, traditional ecological um, knowledge to help support our land stewardship. Um, that has actually played very well in our communication with the EU, Japan, um, the Middle East, in the, in the way we are telling the story of the producers we represent. And so um, I think if there's a way that we can continue to elevate and support the producers on the ground that are really um, pushing for more sustainable, sustainable and regenerative um, farming production type of methods. I think that's really important and good conversation we can have. Mr. Redhouse, I think that that's, you know, really fascinating. In the Virgin Islands, um, our small farmers have been utilizing methods um, for resiliency, combating drought, combating um, hurricanes, etc., for some centuries now. And um, I'm sure in tribal lands as well, um, farmers are doing that. I think it's important that we, as members of the larger agricultural community, Department of Agriculture, and even Commerce, gives them tools so that they can replicate this on a larger scale um, to farmers in other areas who may have similar issues, um, similar challenges, to utilize those skill sets um, as trading, you know, um, exporting those skill sets. Um, to other farmers in other areas. I, I'd be happy to work with you on that um, and look to my staff reaching out to you to provide some support on that. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> as chair of the House Agriculture, Biotechnology, Horticulture and Research Subcommittee, I'm interested in ensuring that U.S. agricultural producers have those tools and innovations needed to farm successfully and sustainably However, I understand discriminatory trade practices from our trade partners can limit exports of U.S. grown goods, which in turn limit growers' ability to adopt those innovations. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I wanted to know if one of our witnesses um, would like to talk about the underlying problems potentially with China's regulatory process and any recommendations to U.S. policymakers on how to address that. Hmm. Well, I can attempt. I can attempt to. Uh, sure, I can attempt to answer that. Uh, so, uh, the American Soybean Association. Uh, we talk to our, our the people who are developing those uh, new technologies in the seed area, and uh, we we discourage them from bringing anything to the market uh, that has not been okayed in in our uh, primary export markets. So the Chinese, uh, the Europeans, uh, the Mexicans, uh, if they do not okay these uh, uh, new technologies that we use to uh, further our, um, uh, our sustainability on the farm, uh, we encourage them not to uh, put them onto the market because uh, that would be a, a disruptive uh, figure if, uh, if they made it to market and then got into the export channel. So. Uh, it, is, uh, it is critical that we uh, get some uh, uh, regulatory um, sanity uh, in other countries uh, based on science uh, around our new, our new technology, and uh, that would help us uh, greatly on the farm become more sustainable, uh, and, uh, and that is, uh, that's what, what I'm after on my farm. I, I want to continue my generational uh, move towards uh, maybe my grandkids and, and their kids uh, having the ability to farm, and uh, those new technologies are important to us. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity, and I yield back. We thank uh, the representative for her participation and her questions. Um, and uh, Mr. Scott, uh, having uh, myself uh, a third generation uh, family farm from California, 
these non-tariff uh, or non-trade tariff barriers uh, that we find, in my view, raising itself through phytosanitary standards and others, oftentimes more of a an excuse or an attempt to leverage markets to, uh, I think, uh, limit the kind of fair uh, level playing field that we ought to be having uh, with our trading partners is always seemingly an issue with different countries that we have to stay on top of and, and, and focus and, and try to make sure that we proceed with enforcement efforts when, when needed. So I thank your comment. Uh, before I make my f uh, final comments, I will recognize my colleague and friend, the gentleman from South Dakota, for any closing uh, statement that he wish wishes to make. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this has been excellent, and I think we've seen tremendous common ground from the witnesses as well as from members on the subcommittee on both sides of the aisle. Uh, just to recap, I think we've heard about the tremendous importance of market access for all of these commodities we've been talking about. That's number one. Number two, we have heard uh, that CPTPP would have a tremendous positive impact uh, on, on American ag producers. Uh, number three, we have heard that uh, we uh, a more robust approach toward free trade agreements from this administration would be helpful in advancing. Uh, the cause of, of removing tariff barriers, as well as uh, non-tariff barriers, which are so often, as, as you and Mr. Scott are talking about, are not science-based and are flimsy pretenses toward protectionism. Right. Um, and then uh, finally, how important it will be to get Ambassador Tai here. Mr. Chairman, I know you're working on that, but if we're going to get a more robust uh, push toward free trade agreements. Uh, this has got to be something that, that will be done uh, in, in, uh, with Congress and the administration working together, and I think Ambassador Tai's presence will be tremendously helpful. So thanks for your leadership in these areas, uh, sir, and I yield back. Thank the uh, gentleman uh, for his comments, and uh, I think you did a good job in summarizing it. <clears throat> we are working to have Ambassador Tai uh, address the uh, House Ag Committee, uh, certainly our subcommittee, but probably I, I know the chairman and the ranking member would probably prefer she address the entire Ag Committee, and that's fine. Uh, but we need her engagement with us to determine how we can work together. Uh, we also need the Senate to confirm uh, Elaine Trevino, <laughs> uh, who's been uh, nominated uh, almost two months ago. Uh, to make sure that the USDA has um, that person in place to represent American agriculture in terms of these trade issues. Uh, I've worked with her for many years in the past and uh, know her to be uh, a, a very strong advocate on behalf of agriculture. Um, and um, as I've said before, uh, this subcommittee on livestock and foreign agriculture will continue to focus on all of the above. Uh, this is uh, but one of uh, a continuing series of hearings that we will have uh, on the issues of trade and, and the supply chain crisis that we are facing today. Uh, I think uh, we've got to really work on a bipartisan basis to do all of the above, both the short-term remedies to the problems with our supply chain uh, uh, challenges and, and uh, that's impacting American agriculture as well as other American industries. Uh, and also the longer term issues that uh, we can deal with, such as the legislation that our colleague and friend, uh, Congressman Garamendi, is, uh, uh, is carrying that many of us are principal co-sponsors of. Um, and, um, and then finally, obviously, the infrastructure package that the President signed earlier this week, I think in, in the long term as well, is going to expand capacity. Uh, for uh, our ability to move goods and, and products uh, to markets where we can certainly compete if it's a level playing field. Uh, you know, the situation, as I noted uh, at the outset with Long Beach and Los Angeles, um, uh, who would have thought that 40% of the container uh, packages go through that one port? Uh, but they also, and I work with them, are having a higher utilization of, of traffic uh, in the last uh, six months than they had pre-pandemic. So you got to keep that in mind too, because there is a built-up demand. There's been a lot of savings by Americans uh, over this pandemic period, and that pent-up demand is, uh, is uh, we see, uh, resulting in part for a very uh, uh, expansion of uh, American consumers 
which creates more demand, which also has other relation effects to the inflation that we're dealing with. So it's, um, it's a challenge and challenge on multiple fronts. This subcommittee has a responsibility, I think, to play a part and a constructive part to helping uh, deal with uh, the challenges that we are facing, and we will continue that work. So I want to thank the witnesses. Uh, I think your testimony was uh, on point and it focused uh, committee members in areas where we can be constructive now in the near term as well as in the longer term when we look at the reauthorization of the Farm Bill. There were good comments as related to uh, the market access program and some of the other areas. And then uh, we will continue to work with all of you. And I want to thank the members of the committee. I want to thank the witnesses. And uh, we have uh, a lot of work to continue to do, but this brings this subcommittee hearing to a, an adjournment, and I want to thank everybody. The committee is now, oops, one moment. Under the rules of the committee, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days. I must say this, the magic words, to receive additional material and supplementary written responses from any witness to any question by a member, as it is appropriate. So without any objections, so moved. The committee, subcommittee is now adjourned. <laughs>